So good morning, let's get started. Any questions? Questions? So this week we are wrapping up the electrostatics chapter that will also be on uh, the midterm. And uh, the two topics uh, that remain to be covered are electric field boundary conditions and then capacitors. Uh, and uh, related to that, uh, the subject of electrostatic energy. So let me remind you what boundary conditions is about. It is about the transition of electric field across material boundaries. So the general setup of the problem is this one. You have two materials, epsilon 1, sigma 1, epsilon 2, sigma 2, uh, described by permittivities and conductivities. And you know the electric field on the one side, and the boundary conditions will hopefully tell you what, are, what is the electric field on the other side. So these are boundary conditions, like the boundary conditions that mathematicians are talking about, that define uh, conditions on points at the boundary, point by point. So although this boundary extends over a wide range, it may be curved, it may have different realizations, uh, the conditions will tell you on a point by point basis how this transition takes place. And it's a very practical question because uh, rarely, except for homework problems, do we work with homogeneous infinite spaces. Practically, spaces, devices, and so on have uh, multiple materials. Uh, simple capacitors will have conductors with dielectrics. PCBs, the printed circuit boards that all the integrated circuits are developed on, will have a backplane for a conductor, a dielectric and above it uh, simply air. So this is, uh, the, this is the context of this discussion. Uh, so if I go at one point then at the interface and I focused on that, then I can basically always draw a tangent line and I focus at the point around, the interface looks flat. No matter how curved or whatever shape the interface has, locally it can be considered as flat and this uh, unit vector pointing normal to the interface is actually a direction of reference it's a direction of reference and in fact I will look at how components of the electric field parallel to this vector and perpendicular to this vector very individually. So the first step when I have an interface like this and I have an electric field E1 here on this side is actually to draw this unit vector and hat that points from medium 1 to medium 2 and then I decompose the electric field into these two components. One is um, parallel to this normal unit vector, if that makes sense, so it's parallel to the normal, so that means it is poking the interface, so E1N is basically the projection of the electric field onto, the, uh, onto this uh, unit vector, so that has length 1, and E1T is actually can be formally found as n cross E1. So this is the tangential component of the electric field. So for example, if your interface is at z equals 0, the normal unit vector will be the z hat unit vector. The normal components would be, so let's say this is the z equals 0. The normal unit vector would be the z hat unit vector the um, E1N will be the Z component of the electric field and the tangential components would be the E1, uh, let's say if we have a, an XYZ, the Y and the X. So these two are the tangential components and this is the normal component. So normal pokes the interface, tangential components skip the interface. They, uh, they run parallel to the interface. So this is the terminology and we, the boundary conditions actually specify how normal and tangential components vary individually 
across the interface. So here they are, the uh, boundary conditions. And I want, I'll give you the conditions, I'll give you an example, and I won't really get stuck in the proof. If you want to see details, how these are derived, uh, the book provides them, and I'm happy to uh, discuss them offline. But the boundary condition on the normal components is n hat cross, uh, sorry, n hat dot d2 minus d1. So the vectors, the electric flux density on the two sides of the interface equals to rho sub s. And rho sub s is surface charge density right at the interface. at interface. Okay. So where does this come from? It comes from applying Gauss's law. That's why you see here things that are invoked in Gauss's law, the electric flux density and the surface charge density. So if we go and apply Gauss's law in a cylinder, let's say, that is placed like this at the interface, so if I apply Gauss's law here, this is ds, this is ds, this is ds, this is ds at the cylinder. So if I apply Gauss's law, that tells me that the total electric flux is equal to the enclosed free charge. Remember, once we introduced, as of last lecture, the electric flux density vector into Gauss's law, whatever is on the right-hand side is just free charge. It's not polarization charges or bound charges that we saw in polarizations. The whole point about introducing the electric permittivity and the electric flux density here is that now on the right-hand side you have only free charges. So this can only exist if you have conductors because free char charges are free in conducting media. If you have pure dielectric insulators, all charges are bound and there is no free charges. The right hand side is zero in dielectrics. So here we are. If you uh, apply this on a cylinder and then you let the height of this cylinder go to zero. And why do I do this? It is because I'm interested just at the interface. So I don't want a cylinder that goes away from the interface. I just squeeze the cylinder. Imagine those cups that you can uh, squeeze. You can have to squeeze the cylinder really close to the interface because I'm interested in uh, boundary conditions. Then there will be no flux through the sides of the cylinder because I'm squeezing it to zero. I'm taking this H to zero. So all the flux here goes to zero. So then what flux remains? The flux through the top and the flux through the bottom. So the flux through the top is responsible for this term and the flux through the bottom is responsible for this term. And what is the only possibility that I enclose charge as I'm squeezing the cylinder? The only possibility is if there is charge on the interface, then I will have enclosed charge. If there is no charge on the interface, I will have none of the enclosed charge. So the only case is if there exists a surface charge density right at the interface, in which case, as I close the cylinder, I squeeze the cylinder, I enclose some free charge. So that is the condition, that the electric flux density becomes discontinuous if you have charge at the interface. So, by the way, this n dot d2 is what we called d2n, the normal component to the interface, that's the one and you see why uh, this boundary condition refers only to normal components. It's related to Gauss's law, and Gauss's law is about fluxes. So the tangential components, as I squeeze the cylinder, won't introduce any flux into this problem. And therefore, they are not part of this boundary condition. Uh, so this is D2n, and that D1 is D1n. And then basically this says that D2n minus D1n is equal to surface charge density if such surface charge density exists. 
And there are two uh, special cases, dielectric to dielectric interface. So if I have a dielectric to dielectric interface, again, all charges are bound. There is no free charge, and therefore, there is no surface charge density. If I don't have free charge to begin with, I cannot make a charge density out of no free charge. And therefore, the right-hand side will be zero, and in that case, this will be continuous. Now, notice the difference. Now, the electric field, in this case, is discontinuous, because D is dielectric permittivity times electric field. So, in fact, the normal components of the electric field are discontinuous. And you see that the uh, epsilon 2 comma n is epsilon 1 over epsilon 2 e 1 comma n. So, the normal electric field is discontinuous. We will see an example in, in a little bit to um, reinforce these concepts. Second special case, if one of the two is a perfect conductor. So let's take a medium one. So what happens if one of the two is a perfect conductor? That is, if we have a situation like this, perfect conductor, at z equals 0, and then in the perfect conductor the electric field is 0, in here the electric field doesn't have to be 0, as we saw in the case of the capacitor. I already uh, gave the answer to the question. In that case, D1 is 0, and therefore the condition becomes equals Rosa Bess. So in that case, uh, the normal component of the D vector is equal to Rosa Bess. This is a condition we have already seen in the capacitor, in this parallel plate capacitor. Uh, if you remember, in the parallel plate capacitor, The electric field goes from the positive plate to the negative plate. So we can express this as uh, minus z hat v over h. Or we can express it as, that is, was the original formula that we saw, uh, rho s 0 epsilon naught, where uh, epsilon now, that we uh, have a general dielectric epsilon in between. Uh, well, where rho s naught is the constant surface charge density here. And we have exactly... We have exactly the opposite charge density on the other side. We have exactly the opposite charge density on the other side. So maybe I will increase my microphone volume. Okay, so now if we go and uh, let's say apply at this boundary, the boundary condition, so I go to z equal zero, just like I have there, this n hat will be the z unit vector. In this case, you see the electric field has no tangential components at all. All of it is normal. The entire thing is normal and it hits uh, the interface, and um, if we apply the boundary condition at z equal uh, zero, n hat d2, so d is epsilon times this, it's minus z hat rho s comma zero, right? So minus z hat rho s comma zero is equal to rho s at z equal zero. So you see this is an identity. So indeed we know that the surface charge density on this conductor is equal to minus rho s naught. 
And that brings me to another point that typically when we apply those boundary conditions, we know whether we expect positive or negative charges. And let's say you mixed up the direction of the vectors or you forgot or you didn't copy the condition over from the H sheet and you found a positive one. Uh, just by checking, you can see that um, uh, here you expect a negative charge. The electric field just sinks into this conductor. So that means there is a negative charge density there. And that's exactly what the condition gives you. Z that Z is 1 with a minus 1 minus rho S comma naught equals to rho S at Z equals 0. And that is the boundary condition. You can also use this boundary condition to correlate the voltage between the conductors to the surface charge. And that will be very important uh, later on in capacitors, so I will do that later. Let me just uh, save this for, uh, for later. But this is the first condition uh, that uh, relates the normal components. Um, the example that I will do after I finish uh, the tangential as well uh, will hopefully clarify some of these, but in the meantime, any other questions? Yes? In the equation there, is um, epsilon the primitive constant the relative one or the absolute one? It is the absolute one. Okay. It is the absolute one. So if you look at this formula, it was one of the first that we derived in free space. It had here an epsilon naught. So the point with dielectrics is that wherever you have epsilon naught, you just uh, append the relative, and then the product of this is epsilon. Yes? Uh, I didn't understand the part where you, uh, like the, where you try to uh, find the value of a, a, the rho, rho s at a z equals to zero. Can you go over that part of it? So I'm applying this condition here. I'm not trying to find anything. I'm applying the condition. The condition has on the right hand side the surface charge density on that interface. The interface now coincides with the lower plate of the capacitor. And uh, you know the right hand side has to have the rho s on that plate. When the normal vector is the z hat vector. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you see, so I'm just copying over the condition here and I apply it for this situation. Here, the D2 is like the negative Z at uh, rho S at zero. That's right. It is uh, the D on the side of the, of the dielectric. OK, so second condition is actually a very useful one, more useful than this one, because in this case, I may or may not know the surface charge density. So it is a condition that may get me in more trouble than um, than I started with. So boundary condition on tangential components now. Again, I have this situation and I have the n hat. And the boundary condition is that the tangential components across the interface are unconditionally continuous. So that's what makes this very useful. N cross E2 minus E1 is zero unconditionally. The electric field tangentially to an interface is always continuous. And unconditionally so. Uh, basically, if you are in a circuits lab and you are taking a resistor, Okay. And you want to measure the voltage, no matter how you will connect your voltmeter, you find exactly the same thing. That voltage is caused by the electric field. However, this resistor is actually a complicated situation where you have a transition from air to a conductor and then air again. So this condition tells you that the voltage across the resistor is caused by the tangential electric field. And that tangential electric field actually across all these interfaces remains continuous. And uh, this is a natural condition. You have used it quite a bit. And it's uh, grounded on to the E dot DL equals 0. Because if you imagine running E dot DL equals 0 across the interface, and maybe I will need some more space for, for this, which I will borrow from the next board.
So this is the interface. This is E1, E2. Uh, this is E1. The tangential component is E1T. This is the tangential component E2T. Okay, so when I run this uh, law E dot DL equals zero across this closed path, Again, I will let the height of this path go to zero because I want to focus on the interface. I'm deriving a boundary condition. Therefore, I squeeze this path as close to the interface as possible. Therefore, this integral gives me non-zero values only from the upper branch and the lower branch. And you see that the electric field has the normal and the tangential components, but the normal components, that DL, will give me zero along this path and this path. So therefore, from the upper path, I'm getting E2T, and from the lower path, I'm getting E1T. So this comes from the upper path, this comes from the lower path. And uh, you see that we saw two laws in electrostatics, Gauss's law and uh, E dot DL is zero over a closed path. And the one is used to give me the first set of boundary conditions and the other one, the second um, group of boundary conditions. Okay, so here is an example. Here's an example, just so that uh, it's more like a toy problem, so that we can see the two boundary conditions. So I'm setting up an interface. So it's first example. I'm setting up an interface on the XZ plane. So the interface is at Z equals zero between two dielectrics, the one has relative dielectric permittivity epsilon r1 equal to 4. The second has epsilon r2 equal to 1. So we have two dielectrics. Um, the second one looks like air. Okay, so then on the one side we have the incidence of an electric field E1 at 60 degrees, so immediately I analyze it into two components. This angle is 60 degrees. So you see the Z component is basically the normal here because that's the one poking the interface. And this is the tangential, the X component is the tangential because it skips the interface. So E1 X is E1, T. And the question is to find the electric field in the second space. Okay, so since we have a dielectric to dielectric interface, Dielectric, dielectric to dielectric interface. The surface charge density here is zero. So basically there are no free charges since I have two dielectrics. As a result, there can be no surface charge density. That means that um, the electric flux through the interface is continuous. So epsilon 1 E1 comma n is equal to epsilon 2 E2 comma n. So this is uh, the first condition. Okay. 
uh, epsilon 1 is epsilon r1 epsilon naught so 4 epsilon naught epsilon 2 is epsilon naught uh, the normal, uh, the normal uh, components are the Z components and therefore I have finally that 4 times E1, Z is 1 times E2, Z. So you see the normal component is the Z component poking the interface. Uh, so that means that the E2Z is 4 times E1Z. Uh, you see E1Z is, uh, and I forgot to mention that uh, E1 is uh, a 5 volt per meter field. So let E1 be a 5 volt per meter electric field, the amplitude. So therefore, I can find how much E1Z is, it's 5 volts, 5 volt per meter, 5 volts per meter times the cosine of 60 degrees. The cosine of 60 degrees is 1 half. So therefore this is uh, 10, 10 volts per meter. So this is the field, uh, the uh, field component in the Z direction on the second space. Let me just make a better two here. Uh, on the other hand, the X component is tangential to the interface. It skips the interface. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so I'm kind of confused here. Like here, the 10 volt per meter, is that the magnitude of E2 or the, like the total value? It is the magnitude of the Z component. So right now, what I have found for E2 is that the Z component here will be 10. And now I will find X so that I can completely determine the vector, okay? So the X component, there is not much thinking to be done. It is continuous. So E2X will be equal to E1X and that will make it 5 volts per meter times sine of 60 degrees, which is uh, square root of 3 over 2. So that will be 5 square root of 3 over 2 volts per meter. So that now has completed my exercise. Uh, the, you see, the, the length of this is exactly equal to the length of this. So it will be 5 square root of 3 over 2. So this is uh, the total E2. So E2 will be uh, all in all So this is the vector. If you are interested in finding also the angle, the tangent of uh, theta prime, of this angle theta prime between uh, the electric field is 5 square root of 3 over 2 divided by 10. And that makes a theta prime equal to 23.41 degrees if you invert the tangent. So you see as the electric field goes from the high index, the high uh, epsilon medium to the low epsilon medium, it actually uh, bends uh, downwards. So you have here the 60 degrees and here you have the 23.41 degrees. Uh, this uh, is electrostatic field. It may be reminiscent of what you see in refraction, in light refraction in optics, because uh, the same conditions guide the refraction of field, that material, uh, the refraction of light in material interfaces. However, these are electrostatic fields, and uh, there is no light involved here or a frequency involved here. So that's how this works. Any questions? So. Whenever crossing at the electric surface, the 
electric field changes its direction in a way? Yes, yes. That is also what you see in light uh, refraction, right? So, because the tangential components remain always continuous, and then the normal components will change. Uh, yes. Like, since the OS here is zero, right? That means that everything that goes in will go out in equal amount, right? That's right. Shouldn't that, like but the flux, flux is permittivity times electric field. So therefore, the electric field is discontinuous. So the flux is continuous. Remember that total flux is caused by free charges. In this case, there is no free charges. And polarization charges. And these polarization charge densities, remember those dipoles that are forming under the influence of an external field, depend on the material. So then the electric field actually has to change. Because it is due to both. So the total flux remains continuous. Yes? Uh, so did you say that when there is no surface charge, the flux is continuous? The flux is continuous, yes. Okay. Yes. So the boundary condition, I don't have it anymore uh, here, but I, will, uh, I can write the two conditions here as a summary. Okay, that we have uh, here this material interface. So first condition, n dot d2 minus d1 is rho sub s. So if rho sub s is zero, then the normal flux through the interface is continuous because you have zero here. So uh, normal components of the d vector can differ only if there is surface charge density. And on the other hand, n cross E2 minus E1 is 0. This is, this, uh, you see the n dot projects the uh, vectors onto n. So it gives you the normal components. n cross takes all other components. So it gives you the tangential components. So that means that tangential electric field is unconditionally continuous at all interfaces. That's a very important boundary condition, very practical as well. So you don't have, when you take the voltmeter, you don't have to worry which side of the resistor uh, you are measuring from precisely because the electric field is continuous. Okay, any other questions? All right, so let me then go back uh, this is the second example in uh, the parallel plate capacitor. So uh, the parallel plate capacitor, we have seen it multiple times. It is because it's actually a very important um, structure, very simple, but at the same time, very important. So uh, this is uh, the z-axis. The lower plate is at z equal 0, the upper plate at z equal h. And we have seen time and again, if you connect this to a voltage source, so that V is equal to V0, you put a dielectric in between. Let's say the height here is H between the plates. The electric field points from the always in the direction of decreasing potential, from the high potential to the low potential, and is equal to minus V0 over H in the Z hat direction. So this is the most practical use of the capacitors. If you remember when we started talking about this, we took uh, the surface charge density on the plates. And then we found the electric field with respect to the surface charge density. As you know from your experience, it's not very practical. We're not really having any charge generators that we're putting the charge on the plates. We have actually a voltage source and we connect it to the plates. So actually this is the 
most uh, practical use case for a capacitor. So if we are in this situation, how do we figure out how much charge there is on these plates? The answer to this is through boundary conditions. So I can go and apply boundary conditions separately on the upper plate and the lower plate. This is the upper plate. And this is the lower plate. So I will just put them separately from each other so that you can see them better. In the first case, let me define a normal vector like this and hat. Okay. And uh, that is the z hat unit vector. And I will take the same normal vector here. And equal z hat. All right. Inside the conductors, on the top and the bottom, the field is zero. So electric field, in, so in this case, this is my region one, this is my region two, and in this case, D2, E2 are both equal to zero. In this case, this is my region one, this is my region two, and inside the conductor E1, D1 is equal to zero. Outside the conductor, in the first case, E1 is basically minus V0 over H Z hat. And that means that uh, D1 is equal to minus epsilon, the epsilon of the dielectric, Z hat. The electric field, in fact, is constant everywhere. So whatever you have in front of the upper plate, you have also in front of the lower plate. It's exactly the same. So here, D2 is equal to minus epsilon v naught over h z hat. Okay. So I'm doing this example just to show the value of good bookkeeping in the sense that I draw the normal vector, I define my region 1, my region 2, and now I'm ready to apply the boundary conditions at z equal h and that d2, d2 is 0, so I'm applying here this boundary condition. You see, I have no tangential components in this case. So in this case, the tangential component boundary condition is 0 is equal to 0. The entire electric field pokes the interface. There is no component of the electric field that skips the interface. It's just normal. So n dot 0 minus d1 is equal to rho s at z equal h. So this n hat is also z hat. All right. So then what do I have? Minus and minus gives me plus. z hat dot z hat gives me 1. And I have that the rho s at z equal h is positive as I was expecting v naught over h. And now I can go to the lower uh, plate. At the lower plate, at z equal 0, the condition is again z hat dot. Now I have the second field being minus e epsilon v naught over h z hat minus zero inside the conductor I have zero field and that is equal to rho s at z equal zero as I expect I should have there a negative charge density and indeed that's what this gives me rho s at z equal zero is minus epsilon v naught over h. So you see the two plates have 
opposite surface charge densities. Opposite surface charge densities. So what is the charge on the plate? If uh, we take area A of the plate of the capacitor, we have a constant surface charge density. So here I will have some charge plus Q, here some charge minus Q. So the charge Q at uh, the upper plate will be epsilon V naught over H times the area and the opposite charge I will have on the upper plate, on the lower plate. Sorry. Okay? So I multiply the surface charge densities. And now you see that if I divide, so I have here plus Q minus Q. So this is, this is the, what I call plus Q, this is minus Q. So you see that if I divide Q over V0, the charge divided by the voltage between the capacitors, I have a quantity that in fact is independent of voltage and it depends only on the parameters of the capacitor. This is called the capacitance of the capacitor. Uh, the units of capacitance are Coulomb per volt. which is farads. And that gives me now an, the, the units for epsilon, for the electron permittivity, which I had mentioned in the beginning. It is farad per meter. So if you work out the units here, because you have area by length, uh, the units of epsilon are farads per meter. So distributed capacitance. So this is farad. In fact, uh, what I just derived, that the ratio between charge and voltage in a capacitor is a constant characteristic of the material and the geometry of the capacitor and unrelated to the voltage or the charges that I put in there, is a general fact about capacitors. And uh, whenever we try to determine, even practically in industry, when you, tr you, when you have an array of interconnects in a CPU and, uh, or a GPU, and you want to find the capacitance between the conductors in the interconnect array. Why? Because that capacitance affects the delay of signals, of clock signals that propagate in a CPU or a GPU or digital signals in a communication system. We follow exactly the same path. That is, we apply voltages on the conductors, and then we use boundary conditions to find the charge, and then we do Q over V equals the capacitance. Yes, please, sorry. I'd like to ask why your D2 is the opposite of Sorry? Why is it also negative? Which one? Oh, this one? Because it, is, it comes from this field that goes in the minus Z direction. Actually, the electric field is always going downwards in the capacitor. It's constant. But you said our electric field was negative, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is negative. Yes. Minus Z hat. Minus Z hat. It's in the minus Z hat direction. But D2 is traveling in the opposite direction. Uh, nothing is traveling because they are all electrostatic fields. Okay. D2 is not traveling anywhere. It's actually the, el the electric flux on the second side, okay. which is this side. Yes. So it is this one. It is the same field. It is the same field. So it is still going downwards. So you see the electric field in this parallel plate is everywhere constant. And therefore, always, no matter where you look, in the upper plate or the lower plate, you will see exactly the same field going downwards. The electric field goes downwards, electric flux density is epsilon times the electric field. So in general,
A capacitor is a system of two conductors So, of course, uh, when we are talking about a capacitor, you have always something in mind. The parallel plate, the coaxial, or whatever. But, in the most general way, if you want to define a capacitor, you need two conductors immersed in a dielectric. So, there is a dielectric in between. And this is conductor one, conductor two, and there is a dielectric in between. There is a dielectric in between. Why do we put the dielectric in between? Yeah, so that there is no current between the two conductors. We don't want to short circuit the conductors. We don't want leakage current between the two conductors. We have to charge them and make sure that the charge gets stuck onto the two conductors. So I put a voltage source, I charge the one with Q and the other with minus Q by charge conservation. So before I turn on the voltage source, this system is neutral. After I turn on the voltage source, the system has to remain neutral by charge conservation. Therefore, if I see plus Q on the one conductor, I will see minus Q on the other conductor. You remember a conductor, just so that we review concepts, because you see everything ties together. A conductor, remember, is an equipotential surface. Why it's an equipotential surface? Because Electric field in the conductor is zero, therefore any two points that you take on the conductor, you connect them, E dot DL will give you zero. There is no electric field, no voltage difference. As you say in circuit theory, it is a short circuit. What is a short circuit? It's a place where, as a wire, it's a short circuit, it's a place where all the potentials are the same. And therefore, uh, here I will have the development of an electric field. Remember, the electric field has to be normal on equipotential surfaces. So I draw this diagram utilizing a few concepts that we've learned before, that electric fields start from positive charges, sink on negative charges, and they have to be normal to equipotential surfaces. Therefore, they will hit the conductor at 90 degrees. Now, we have another perspective why the electric field has to hit the conductor at 90 degrees. Anybody can see why? That is, why can I not have a non-zero tangential electric field con component on the conductor? So sometimes, uh, for your review, I will do uh, some conceptual questions on Monday. And here is one conceptual question. Is this diagram, can this diagram be, be right? Electric field line hits the conductor at an angle. Can that be right? No. Why? The one answer, yes, go ahead. There is no electric field in a conductor? That's right. So. So far, we saw one answer to this question. Because the conductor is an equipotential surface, and therefore there can be no, uh, the, the electric field has to be normal to the equipotential surface. Now, through boundary conditions, we have a second answer. Tangential field remains continuous across the interface from the dielectric to the conductor. But inside the conductor, the tangential field has to be zero. And since this is zero, this has also to be zero. And hence, there is no tangential component. So this has to be, this is wrong, and the uh, angles have to always be uh, 90 degrees. So what happens here? If I want to find Q, if I want to find Q, I can apply Gauss's law in a surface that encloses this conductor. So Gauss's law here says that Q is equal to D dot DS. Okay, that is Q. 
And what is the voltage here? The voltage is E dot DL from the positive plate to the negative plate. Well, look at these two quantities. If you increase Q by a factor of X, from this law, it means that the electric field has increased by the same factor. So if Q becomes X times Q, then from Gauss's law, the electric field will have to become X times the electric field. And then from the definition of the voltage, the, the voltage will have to become X times the initial value of the voltage. Sorry, I'm, uh, I know most of you are into, uh, in, the com in computer engineering, so I'm writing this as a code. If I wasn't to, if I, as a MATLAB code, if I were to write this mathematically, I should have introduced primes here, that there is a Q prime. So the Q becomes XQ. If um, Q is multiplied by a factor of 10, let's say, from Gauss's law, I conclude that the electric field has to multiply by a factor of 10, right? But then the voltage will also multiply by the same factor. And that means that Q over V remains constant. So fundamentally, this is why we are interested in the capacitance as a quantity. If it was depending, if any time I put a new charge, the capacitance changes, then we, we wouldn't be interested in a capacitance. You want to buy a capacitor that is 10 picofarad, no matter what charge you put in. So this is why uh, this actually holds. Uh, and the calculation of the charges on capacitors really relies on boundary conditions. So we'll do more examples. Uh, on this tomorrow and we'll finish with the energy that is held by a capacitor and that will conclude the topics that will be covered in the in the midterm so thank you for your attention see you tomorrow